Welcome into the Trevor Stop Show, episode number 20. Today we have a very special guest. We have Jonathan Gomez, the founder and CEO of Jomez Pro. Uh, we're going to talk to Jonathan all about how Jomez started in the first place. We're going to get into all the cool things they're doing now and for, have set for the future. But first, we have a quick word from our friends at Legacy Discs. Legacy Discs is bringing back the Confidence Clash this July. The Confidence Challenge is a fun three-disc style tournament that you can run in your area to raise funds for the local club or the course. The Players Pack is going to come with two premium discs and one putter of the host choice. It also comes with a Legacy Towel and Sticker Pack. In addition to the Players Pack, the winners are going to receive a nice Winners Pack as well. If you want more information about how to run a Confidence Clash or participate in one, make sure to go to LegacyDiscs.com CC22. That's LegacyDiscs.com CC22. And remember, play with confidence. All right. And we're here now with our guest. We have Jonathan Gomez, the CEO and founder of Jomez Pro here today. Thanks for joining the show, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to start kind of all the way back at the beginning. I want to go back to the beginning of Jomez. Um, I know the story is uh, that first round you filmed um, kind of just on a whim is kind of what started Jomez. But before that, uh, leading up to, to 2017, you went full time. Fill in the blanks for me a little bit. You know, how did it get from that first round that you filmed just kind of on a whim to going full time in 2017? Yeah, so I was uh, in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina for the 2012. Uh, it was the pro and amateur world championships combined together. Last time that has happened since, um, just not really possible anymore. But um, yeah, so I was there playing uh, as an amateur. And was just kind of uh, had my camera with me. Didn't really do a whole lot of disc golf uh, video. I was just playing mostly, but it was kind of a vacation. So I uh, I picked up the camera and filmed the pros whenever I was done playing my rounds uh, every day. And then, yeah, just ended up filming the final nine. Just uh, kind of happened upon the, the, the fairway and no one else was really filming. And I wasn't really supposed to be there, but figured I would just give it a shot, fake it till I make it type of thing yeah and then yeah no one ever kicked me off and i posted the video then and uh um yeah i ended up seeing a lot of good uh a lot of good feedback from that I hadn't really ever posted anything like that to my youtube channel as it had existed and that would had been the most successful you know most watched thing that i had ever posted so um still couldn't really commit to anything but i thought it was awesome because i still i still liked playing more than anything at the time i used to play quite a few events every year in, in Texas. And so, yeah, went back home, posted it. Then uh, the next year I did 2013 uh, Texas States, just did the final round. Wasn't really, wasn't really thinking, putting too much thought into to any of it. It was just kind of like, Hey, this is fun. I'm going to go play. And then every now and then I'll find a tournament in Texas and go film it. And yeah, yeah same thing happened. I didn't really do anything else in 2014. I, uh, Got my buddy Michael, Michael Fouché, who some people now know as Fall of Flight Mike, got him to come in and, and be the the catch cam for me. I wanted to do two camera angles because one was just like, it was really tough to like get the full effect of, of how far these these players were throwing or in the woods and a, and a crazy like blind shot or something. So yeah, then we did that one and then we were invited to Emporia to do uh, the glass blown open, which, you know, it's a lot bigger now, but even back then it was a big deal. So that oh, was yeah. really cool. Um, yeah, 2015, we, we went really hard on, uh, on hitting as many tournaments as we could in 2015, we were traveling to, we were finally like hopping on planes and going to tournaments, just me and Michael, we filmed 10 events that year. So that was really cool just to be like, all right, you know, this is what it's like to just keep showing up for people to like actually want us to be there. And yeah. of course the, the people w were loving what we were doing. We weren't doing next day or anything, but we were just posting more consistently, um, yeah, and then 2016, we we uh, we got Jerry Jerry Gomez involved to uh, started to he took over my role as the the T cam, and I started to be able to do reaction cam, slow mo things like that. Really, just trying to up the product quality yeah. and trying to be a little bit more intentional with graphics and scoring. You know, still weren't doing commentary or anything really, but then once we got to Worlds that year, 2016 Worlds was our first time filming Worlds uh, since 2012, and the first time we were actually hired to film worlds instead of just kind of showing up. But, um, yeah. yeah, that was, uh, that was awesome. Cause then we got one, Juan Luis Garcia, who was doing overstable studios at the time had done some work at Central coast, but he came on with us and just really knocked it out of the park with the graphics. We had our first like pay, <clears throat> paid commentators, Nate Sexton and Steve Hill, 
Um, so that was really cool. That was like the turning point for us. It was 2016 as we, as we uh, started to get towards the end of that year, we knew that something was was really special, and we were building a really solid team. And then yeah, I just got to 2017. Steve Dodge was going into the second year of the Disc Golf Pro Tour, and he was really wanting some some consistent media presence there. You know, Smashbox is doing live, but he wanted to do some 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 post production and some uh, like recaps, you know, event recaps and things like that. So yeah, whenever he told told me that you know we were guaranteed ten events that year on tour. I was like, okay, this is all. This is what we're looking for. We're looking for some consistency in this, uh, in this business that we were trying to build. It was still a hobby, but you know, we were like, if this is gonna be a business, you know, having some sort of consistent work is is what we were looking for. So when he told us that, and then Michael, myself, and Jerry, we were like, okay, I guess if we're gonna give it a shot, we got to quit our jobs and and really and really commit to it. So that's what we did. And wow. Uh, yeah, that that was what changed everything. Really, it was 2017. Was being able to just quit our jobs, go full time on tour. Uh, oh yeah, I'm wearing the shirt. So yeah, this is like the first RV we the the artist drew oh, up. Nice. It was like Forest River Georgetown. It was like a 30 foot RV. It was like a 2005 or something in 2017. So it was already kind of old, but we didn't have any experience with any of that with RVs or traveling on the road or touring yeah. or anything. But we went for it. You know, it's like whatever. You know, if we fail. We'll uh we'll just come back home and get and pick up our jobs where we left off or get new jobs or whatever. We weren't really too concerned. We didn't have a a whole lot tying us, you know, yeah. back to home. I mean, obviously we had family and stuff, but we didn't like have you know wives and kids and stuff like that. So we sure. were just like, all right, well, let's go for it because uh, it's the only way. It's, it's the only way we're gonna find out if this is if this is legit and if it's uh, if it's a real deal. So and it was. I mean, as soon as we committed it everything changed we had we had one on board full time with graphics and and we had this guy starframe doing all of our original music and we had nate and germ doing the commentary i mean that's not how it started but eventually by the end of 2017 big sexy commentary was born and that's just like yep. that's that changed everything for for commentary like you know obviously everyone has their own vibe but that's where we found our our sound and our and a really good team so yeah, 2017 was was where everything completely changed. It was awesome. Definitely. Well, it's cool to to hear about that progression from year to year, kind of easing into it. And it's also cool that you almost got to imitate what it's like being a touring disc golfer. You know, slowly testing the water and then finally just buying the RV and going for it. Uh, as mm -hmm. you were kind of learning the art of coverage, what was kind of the biggest struggles when trying to figure it out back then? Yeah. So the struggles back then was. I mean, when I first started, I was only filming like final nines or final rounds and that was it. I wasn't even filming entire tournaments until 2014, whenever I was like, all right, we're going to show up on the first round and we're going to film all the rounds and we're going to keep score and we're going to like follow the progression of from one round to the next. And then of course it's like, we knew that people were, some people like Ian, you know, Central Coast were doing commentary. Yeah. Um, but we just were like, no, nah, like that's not for us. Like, and people did enjoy it. Like, I don't think we could ever go back but at the time people were like hey i enjoy just the sounds of the round you know because yeah. you kind of hear some chatter or you can tell like how intense the wind is or or whatever's going on there's even just the sound of chains you know just the pure sounds of of the game so we we stuck with that for a long time you know up and through 2016 worlds is when we finally committed to it and never never really looked back but yeah, just, I mean, there's so much to consider whenever you're trying to do this. It's like, what kind of cameras should I be using? And um, how am I going to do scoring while I'm trying to film? And how am I going to, you know, because back then, UDISC wasn't really as prevalent as it was now. Like, we yeah. were taking pictures of paper scorecards at the end of the rounds. And if you forgot, then you were in trouble because then you'd <laughs> have to go track them down. And that happened enough times or you learn not to forget because you'd be like, oh, crap, you know. I have to find who out who the TD was and ask him if he can send me a picture of a scorecard or whatever, you know, it's like, and then there's a lot more room for error because you're entering everything in by hand. And, and so, yeah, there was just a lot that we were learning just as we went, you know, because there wasn't like a, a standard at the time, right. like where you have to emulate this. Cause now when you sign up or you win a bid, for uh, a PDGA event or a Disc Golf Pro Tour event or whatever, it's like these are the standard requirements. It has to be 1080. It has to be, you know, you have to have drone hole previews and you have to have commentary and you have to post it next day. Like, I, that wasn't a thing until 
guys like us in Central Coast and whoever, you know, was in the game at the time were like, we were the ones that were figuring that out because there were certainly media outlets, you know, media companies doing coverage well before we ever did, but sure. there was never anything consistent. Like there might be a team that showed up to come to, you know, the 1998 World Championships or whatever and post it on, you know, and send it out on the VHS. Or there was definitely people doing that, but there just wasn't a standard that was well known enough that was like, okay, you have to do it this way. So back then it was just like, the wild west it was just like you put your own spin on it and there is no standard and so over time when we're all consistently posting and every channel's got their own vibe or whatever but the there was like a, a still like a standard of how things were going to be um yeah. so yeah that and so yeah that it was just like from one tournament to the next sometimes we'd be like well let's try this or let's try this or even back in 2017 when we first like developed things like the follow flight or Slomez, like those were like, we were coming up with those names like on the spot. We were like, oh, Michael made this awesome shot tracker and people are loving it. We have to name it. You know, we didn't have to, but yeah. we were like, well, let's give it a name. And then like Slomez, like slow mo replay didn't need a name. Like <laughs> yeah. we all know what a slow mo replay is, but for some reason we were like, oh, let's let's call it the Slomez. My brother came up with that, and I was like. I thought I, I took it as a joke. He's like, oh, well, that's what we should call it. And I was like, I don't know. Okay, whatever. That's funny. And I remember I told Juan, who was building the graphics, this was at Memorial 2017, like the first event of the year. We were just doing slow mo replays. And then at some point, he threw in a graphic for me to put on the video that said slow mez replay. And I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm this. This is so stupid. Like, this name sounds so dumb. And now it's like a thing, you know, it's like, yeah. whatever, we, we were just making things up. And then like, if it worked, then great, we would keep doing it. And if it didn't, then we would toss it out and just and move on. And like, that's what the beauty of YouTube is, is the people are going to tell you pretty quick, sure. uh, whether or not they're, they're into what you're doing. So that's what I love about it. It's like, it's not always going to be the most amazing thing, but you're going to find out pretty quick whether or not you need to change something, you know, if people Definitely. are into it or not. Well, one of the things that you kind of um, toyed around with and played around with in the early days especially was the graphic package and then the music as well before arriving at that signature Jomez music that we all know today. How many, mm -hmm. how was the process of figuring out that sound that you wanted and was there other ones that you passed over before landing on the one you have today? Oh yeah, I mean, well we used to just pull from, you know, when it came to music we would just pull from all the, the stock sites, you know, like I think yeah. Premium Beat or Shutterstock or whatever. And, um, yeah, as far as graphics, I mean, I was just doing anything I could. I was building, I'm not a graphic designer. I was just, I was just the only one that was like trying to do anything, everything, but you know, and so I was just trying to build stuff from scratch and Photoshop or After Effects or something. And then I would go buy a package from those same places, Shutterstock or whatever. And it just, it, everything just changed. Like as soon as one came on and was like, no, this is, we're going to build our own system. We're going to, you know, do all this and stuff that I would have never been capable of, of doing. And then when it came to music, you know, same thing, we're just kind of trying different things, buying sounds, you know, the royalty free stuff, whatever. And of course, over the years, even in the early days, I would get, you know, emails from people saying, Hey, I'm a music producer, check it out. You know, but we just like never really, I guess we were just, you know, kind of set with what we were doing. You know, I definitely appreciated that people would, you know, I would respond and say, Hey, thanks. I'll, I'll keep you in mind or whatever. Um, but then there was this one guy, um, star frame, but that's what, that's, you know, what he goes by. His name's Ben, Ben Swordlick. Um, he was like, in a in an EDM band, like out in San Francisco, I think. And like, he was pretty, pretty successful, but he was like, Hey, I'm a huge fan of the channel. Like I would love to, you know, I'll, here's some samples of some stuff I've done. I would love to try to come up with something original. And I think he was probably the first person that offered like an original, you know, like to work together and yeah. come up with something rather than just saying, Hey, here's some other stuff I have. You want to use any of it? He was like, let's figure this out together. And I was like, that sounds amazing. So that was like at the end of 2016, I think. So it just all like the timing couldn't have been more perfect. Cause that's when we were, we decided we were going to like commit to this where we needed our own sound. We needed our own, our own look and everything versus just like pulling stuff from, from, you know, royalty free sites or stuff that anybody could have access to. Like, this is when we were like the timing, it just all came together. And then he came up with that first, uh, that first sound in 2017. And I just remember like, we worked on that for 
maybe only a couple of weeks. Like we only had a few versions of it before we landed on the first one. And like, sometimes like some people like that's their favorite song still to this day, you know? Yeah. So, um, it, it was just awesome. And then just from there, just building those relationships like that, like having one on the team. So from one year to the next, making changes on the graphics and, and having this guy, you know, star frame say, okay, we, we got through 2017. That was awesome, but let's, let's change it again. And so that's been the standard every year is 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 is like, they've all got different sounds, um, but they all have like core elements that that yeah. was the plan from the beginning. And of course people hate it. They usually hate it from the very beginning. They hate when we change it. And then <laughs> by the mid season, they're like, Oh my God, that's my favorite one or whatever. It's just funny. Like we have to brace ourselves every year, every time we change that. And, yeah. and, um, you know, even like graphics stuff, like we, I remember, was, I think it was after 17 or 18 one, you know, we were, I can't even remember what city we were in. And, and he called me and was like, Hey, I've got a crazy idea. You know, you can tell me if you hate it, but I'm, I'm thinking like, I I want to get rid of the in-between holes where they pull up the scores. We used to cut away every time to the scores cause they weren't on the screen. Yeah. And he was like, I want to put the scores on screen at all times and get rid of that and just like go straight to the next hole yeah and i was like that is crazy (laughs) but like i'm i'm i said let's do it like like this is different and like like i said before if they hate it they'll tell us and we'll we'll make we'll adjust or we'll go back and so i remember we were the first ones to like to to get rid of the in-between scoring holes like everyone was just doing that yeah and now there's a lot of people that do what we do and put the scores down at the bottom and that was one one created that he created the little symbol system where you don't even have to have the numbers you just put the symbols and now you'll see that all over the place you know and that's just like i love it i don't see it as a bad thing that people wanted to kind of follow our lead on stuff like that like i mean we certainly didn't create every single thing that we ever thought of but we certainly brought a lot of things to disc golf and that's what I loved about just like trying to change things up and take some risks. And then you'll know pretty quick if the fans love it and other people start uh, kind of following your lead on some of these ideas that seemed crazy at the time. Then I guess that's how you know you're doing something right. Definitely. Well, yeah, I didn't know that, that you guys were the first ones to kind of implement that on-screen scoring. But that's super cool. One of the things that you have definitely perfected is the quick turnaround time um, with, the, with the coverage, getting the rounds out almost – you know, it seems like impossible for them to be edited so quickly, especially with the graphic packages that you guys present and all the production value you've, you've implemented now. Talk a little bit about what that process looks like and what kind of strategies you've implemented in order to get the most efficient system possible. Yeah, that's that's been a, a long process, a lot of trial and error. I mean, we started doing Next Day in 2016, um, and even that was – just a lot of long nights and, you know, not sleeping much. And then we went in 2017 and we thought we had everything kind of figured out. And then Juan brought in this amazing graphic system, but then that required us to relearn an entirely new system on the fly. Like I didn't, we didn't even practice with it. He just gave it to me at the memorial and we're just yeah. like, all right, here we go. Like, and like premiere would crash or after effects would crash. And we'd have all these issues, you know, just like, it was just a nightmare, you know, trying to, trying to figure that out on the fly. And so I remember Memorial, like I, I honestly probably slept one to two hours a night during that tournament because it was just staying up all night trying to figure out the system. We had to wait for everything to render. And then I had to get up first thing in the morning to go drive 45 minutes to where Nate and Macbeth were staying to do commentary and then come back and plug it all back in and then upload it. It was just like, yeah. So there's been, I mean, it's been a process. Like all of 2017, like was just I didn't sleep much that entire tour because it was just me, Michael, and Jerry. And then Juan worked remotely, helping us with graphics. But like on the road, it was just us. And um, yeah, I probably aged a lot in those first couple <laughs> years of touring because I was not sleeping. It was bad. Like, but it was just like this is it. This is what we had to do. Like we couldn't start, you know, doing this and then pull back. Like I always told the guys, like if you're like, we're going to strive for consistency so that people know what they can expect from us. And if there's, and if we ever break away from that consistency, it better be because we're improving and not, you know, pulling back or decreasing the the quality of our product. And I, and we've held up to that ever since, like we never once said, we're going to go from three cameras to two, or we're going to not do next day this time, 
yeah. or we're going to not have commentary. You know, just because things got complicated didn't mean, like, as far as the public knew, like, everything was good because it, that's what we wanted was for them to know what to expect from us. So over the years, thankfully, we've built a team. We've spread out the responsibilities. We've gotten faster um, with editing. We've gotten, you know, technology's gotten better, faster computers, faster internet, all these things to help, you know, to our advantage over the years as we built this. Um, yeah, so it's just been awesome um, having just an amazing team that we built over the years to get to that point. But yeah, definitely, it definitely started out as just like, a, why, why did we do this to ourselves? Because no one asked us to do next day. Yeah. You know, we just thought like, if this is, if we're going to continue improving, we've got to figure out a way to get this stuff out faster. We can't wait a few days or a week or whatever. But at the time that was okay. Cause there was nothing, there was no standard set. Like I said, I mean, yeah. just a, just a couple of years before we were doing what, well, when we started, people were still getting their tournaments on DVD. You know, oh, like wow. I remember like Maple Hill had a series, Steve Dodge would produce that. And they would send out the DVDs and there. I used to have world's champion world championships on DVD and stuff like that. Wasn't even that crazy. So whenever YouTube comes around and we start posting it, even just the next week or two weeks later was fine because it was still faster than it was you know, before. And then, then we started the next day and then it kind of got to where once we started it, we never stopped, you know, we never had, we never pulled back and it got to where the other media teams that were doing post produce with us basically had to do the same thing because they couldn't not do next day if we were doing it, you know, and yeah. we, we weren't doing it to say like, Hey, you better do this. It was just, that's just how it was, you know, well, yeah. it's just like once, once there's a standard set, you know, then you just kind of got to fall in line if you want to be in the industry. And like I said, then it comes to the point where you win a bid for a, a national to, or elite series event or, or major. And that's part of the standard now is like, that's something that they've adopted and saying like, Hey, if you're going to cover this event, you have to do it, you know, like everyone else has been doing it for, up to this point so yeah well one of the things that jomez has done uh has been pioneering the graphics such as fall flight and then equipment use as well such as the drone coverage and the uh the different views you're doing with that um and it just really just enhances the golf coverage all around is there any equipment or technology that you think would be a game changer and you'd like to add to the package but it just isn't quite in the cards yet yeah, I mean, it'd be cool to put a camera on a flying disc. Like, <laughs> okay. That would be sick. <laughs> Can <Yeah>. you imagine? <laughs> yeah, that would be incredible. Yeah. Uh, they've got those guys now that are really good those with those FPV drones chasing down discs. But, yeah, you know, that's, that kind of thing would never be practical, obviously, or usable in, in gameplay. But I think for us, it's just um, – I mean, we're, we love when cameras get upgraded. You know, everything looks better. They, they handle – lighting better like if you don't have a good camera you're out there in the the really bright fairways and stuff it can just get kind of washed out and not look good but you know yeah. the, the better the cameras get you know then you can have better control over what what the image looks like um i've always you know enjoyed the just keeping an eye on how uh how much faster computers can be you know like michael builds all our computers and he's great at it because he's always looking for the what's the next graphics card update? What's the next, you know, um, sure. software for, you know, editing or whatever and rendering faster and stuff. But yeah, as far as like what the, the fans would be able to see, um, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say like what the next thing is going to be, you know, like I, we, we obviously, I love watching, you know, the live coverage when I get a chance. I think it's great that, um, that we kind of still, exist alongside each other but you know for them for the sake of live coverage i would just love for the the technology to get uh i guess more accessible to like have consistent you know cell coverage or or satellite feed or whatever with the the best possible picture you know because yeah. i know that that's something they still struggle with which is a big reason why we never went to go went to live because i was like going back to the consistency thing i want you to know exactly what you're getting i don't want you to have to have a, a you know a, a worse picture quality or we can't cover these certain amount of holes because there's just no coverage you know and that and i'm not dogging them at all that's just the limitations that they had to deal with and that was the Definitely, reason why yeah. i was like i just can't see me going to that if we've got this and we know what we can control and we know we can be consistent and the fans will know exactly what to expect from us and that's why you know we we really stuck with that and so yeah if it gets to the point where where the live aspect of of broadcasting and stuff is easier or faster or better quality or whatever 
or you know more affordable then maybe we'll be like all right now it's time to like start thinking about that but even now it's still really difficult and really expensive oh, to yeah. like do it properly so all credit to those guys that have been doing it for all that time because they've been sticking with it and it's been it's been a grind for them i know i mean i'm friends with all those guys and i know how you know i have an idea of how difficult that really is to to pull off so I would say technology wise, yeah, I'd, I'd say that, that it would be awesome for that to be uh, more accessible, more affordable, so that the, the live can, you know, be like what we know, we, what we want it to be, just like if you're watching any other sport live, you know, knowing yeah. that like, that uh, because they have an amazing team, um, I think the technology is just what, you know, what needs to kind of improve for them to like really uh, probably be what, what they would like it to be. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so... I guess I could consider uh, Jomez kind of has a cast these days, if you want to say, like, um, if that's what you want to call him. But it, Big Germ, Nate Sexton, and Paul Yulbari have shined on the Jomez platform. What went into selecting the players to be featured for the commentary and other content? Yeah, so when it comes to commentary, um, I want to say when we first did that, you know, that uh, Worlds 2016, I had done one other thing. You know, we had Nate on commentary one other time with Macbeth at the 2015 Hall of Fame Classic. It was just like on a whim, but people loved it, but it just wasn't practical for us to be able to like do it. It just wasn't, it's too hard to track these players down and find the time to do it and all that. And anyway, so when we, we brought him back on, like that was a no brainer. He was already amazing at it. He was doing some commentary for Central Coast at the time. Um, And then when it came time for, uh, for Worlds, um, same thing. I just like, hunted down Nate and, and Macbeth to start out the season. But I think the very next event was Waco um, and Nate wasn't there. You know, Macbeth was, but I think I just asked like Eagle and Simon to do commentary and, you know, they did it. And then I think for final round or third, you know, second round or something uh, at some point I had asked big germ if he was interested. So we had the three of them on yeah. and big germ was like jumped right in immediately and he loved it. And basically He's been on, I want to say every round since. I don't think yeah. he's missed since 2017 and like March of 2017. So some of it's just like who's there, who's available, who's yeah. who's into it because it's not an easy job. Like Certainly. sometimes these, sometimes people don't. I think a lot of people don't realize how difficult it is for these players that also do commentary because they're they're focused on practicing for the tournament and they need to perform well for that reason, obviously but then they want to be really good at this and they want to be available because it helps their brand. And, um, so yeah, so I told Jerm from the beginning, like I just appreciate you showing up and being available because that's how we got to where we were. Like we yeah. just showed up and we were available and we were reliable and that's where Jerm comes in. You know, he's been the most reliable, you know, since we started and then we pick up Nate again, whenever we had the chance, um, I want to say like, I think it was Nick Hyde Memorial that same year in, in, uh, from Dallas. And then we never really looked back. Um, once, once those guys were a hit, we were just like, all right, let's go for it. And then Yuli comes along and he's amazing. But you know, if it wasn't for like Nate having, having his first child and, and like needing to kind of take some time away and then Yuli stepping in and saying, Hey, I'm available if you, if you need me. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then he was he was right in there too. As soon as, as soon as we gave him the opportunity, he, he showed up, he was reliable and he was really good at what he does. And, and of course, when, whenever it was time for Nate to come back, we were like, I can't kick out Yuli, <laughs> you know, he saved us out there. Right. And so then we got the three of them together and we we're like, let's try it. We don't know. Maybe people are going to hate having three commentators. Maybe they'll talk over each other. Maybe it just won't be a good, a good vibe, but people love it you know so yeah and now we can kind of interchange them out if one guy needs to step out or take a break or whatever like uh they just they're so they're just the most professional uh, commentators i could even imagine like i know that obviously other broadcast sports have have their own thing going but i think as far as disc golf's concerned like they're 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 down to roll with anything because we we require them to be on tour with us you know yeah and um so or you know that's just how how it works out so it's awesome it's it's been so great to uh to be able to to build uh, such an amazing team even if it was just kind of on a whim or on accident or whatever but like i said if just if you for these guys to be show to show up and be reliable and it doesn't hurt that they're amazing at what they do as well that's just how we've kind of built the team we have so far is just based on that a lot of luck 
and just like really good, uh, really good timing on a lot of things as well. So yeah, I probably couldn't do it, do it over again if I, if I tried, if I had to start all over, but I'm just very grateful that we, we've gotten to this point, you know, um, uh, just kind of being, being out there on the road and just things kind of just happening and we're just along for the ride. Yeah, well, it's certainly really cool how that all worked out. And I love that Jomez is just willing to, as a company, just throw things out there and see what sticks. And it's certainly paid off a ton. One thing that you've recently dipped to, into is the documentary world. Um, pretty recently, an Eagles Trail release, and it was a big success. It was a really good um, production. Are there any more documentaries in the future? Yeah, so when it comes to documentaries, um, those are – those are a huge undertaking. Like we, you know, people, people look at us like we're crazy when we tell them we, we cover three or four rounds of disc golf, turn it around in 12 hours, put it out the next day and how much work that is. But I was like, we, we've got this down to a science. Like it took us years to do this, you know, yeah. like documentaries is like starting all over. We're like, Oh gosh, we have to like, you know, go plan out who's going to like, what's the subject? Who is, who's going to like plan out the interviews and then, you know, all the, the B-roll and sound design and, you know, all the cra- all the stuff that goes into like something completely new that we're not like used to. And so when it comes to, when it came to like Eagles Trail, like that was all headed up by uh, Brian Geis and he did an amazing job. And before that, I think he did Throw Canada, which is another one that he produced yeah. along with us in Central Coast. And he's the one that was bringing those amazing ideas and like seeing them through. And I love, you know, both those projects and then the Eagles Trail is so, so awesome. You know, I'm, really good friends with Eagle and Pat, you know, his dad, Pat. And I just was like, I love that we gave, had that opportunity to like tell their story and Brian, you know, heading that up. And if it wasn't for him, it wouldn't have gotten done. And it was so awesome. So when it comes to like those ideas, sometimes it's just like the team members that we have that are like, Hey, this is something I want to do outside of coverage. And we try to be as supportive as we can. And, and we've come up with all kinds of really awesome ideas like putting game and, yeah. and practice round. Like those are all ideas that, that, crew members had had from one time or another day. Ryan Vanderberg has, has come up with a lot of amazing ideas, flashback match play, you know, things like that. Um, so when it comes to like those types of things, like original content and the like off the course content or, you know, non coverage, uh, non competition content, like that's a lot of just like team members having ideas and, and that's just trying to be supportive. And a lot of times it, it works out, you know, for, for the best to, to just kind of let people, you know, so just be supportive of our team members whenever they have ideas. So yeah, we've got some other awesome, awesome things we've been working on that um, I'm, I'm really excited to be able to release it at some point later this year. But you know, same thing, just people come up with ideas and saying, you know, what do you think? And then we have an amazing team that can work together to, to execute these things and just kind of give people more disc golf content because coverage is great but like they want they'll you know as you're aware obviously you're producing a podcast and foundation does a lot of amazing things like people just want content like yeah it doesn't have to be fall into a certain category it's like you can come up with all kinds of creative ideas and that's what's so amazing is that the fans are just are just ready to like see what else is going to come out that's what i love about having so many content creators in disc golf now yeah, it's it's definitely awesome. The landscape is better now than it ever has been, and we certainly look forward to seeing more of the documentary style stuff that comes out of Joe Mez. So I wanted to move over a little bit to kind of some recent stuff that's gone on. Um, leading up to the season, Joe Mez signed a historic contract with the Disc Golf Pro Tour, uh, $500,000 over two years, sealing uh, coverage rights for the next two years. Was paying for that coverage something you've been planning on for a long time, or did it kind of jump out of the blue and surprise you a little bit? No, we knew it was coming eventually. Like even back in like 2017, we were getting paid to come to events. 2018, same thing. As we start to get, I want to say like 2019, it's more like, okay, like, you know, let's just trade for advertising or something instead of you guys getting paid. And then over time, it just kind of slowly started shifting. And we knew it was going to happen because we know that's how all these other major networks, you know, um, they have to bid for the rights to cover these sports. So we knew that was coming. Um, I want to say 2021 was was probably like the last year where there was no money exchange. We didn't get paid, but they did. You know, we didn't have to pay either. We just had a lot of, you know, we had the value in advertising and then they gave us the rights and all that. And so there was still a lot there to trade, but we had an idea that 2022 was going to be finally time where, where the tour was, was uh, worth enough that we were going to actually have to pay for it and then go like and kind of sell advertising and things like that on the back end to, to make up for it. But yeah, yeah it wasn't, 
it wasn't anything that we didn't see coming. Um, it was more about just try to how to work together with the pro tour to, to determine that value. And, you know, we had to start somewhere. So we, yeah. we knew that if we were going to, if we were going to really commit to this for two years to make it worth it for us to make the, make sure the pro tour, you know, it was worth it for them to like agree to that, that it had to be, you know, a pretty significant amount of money so that we could have something to go off of. So basically it, it, it made it to where we, we knew what it was worth and we were willing to pay that and they got their value out of it because, you know, they had to commit to that. Like if someone comes along next year and says, Hey, you know, we're so-and-so from Fox or whatever, and we want to cover this. Well, we protected ourselves. You know, we had to put it up there to like, make sure it was worth it so that we at least, you know, we're in that position to, to know that we, we were going to be providing that, that coverage, you know, for at least the, the two years. So. Yeah, well, it's certainly a historic deal for the sport, um, and I think it's important to set that precedent earlier, uh, early on for what the media rights standard is really going to be as far as pricing is concerned. Um, mm-hmm. What has it been like working with the Pro Tour, especially compared to you know back a few years back to when events were a little more independent, whereas now it's very much an organized entity with a very specific media plan? What's it been like working alongside them at those events? Uh, it's been great. We've We've definitely approached it for as long as I can remember as like a a partnership where we're both, you know, seeing value and working together. Um, We're, we're promoting the disc golf pro tours events and players and, you know, sponsors and things like that while we get to continue to build our product and serve our fans and get our name out there. So it's been great. Um, You know, I've been friends with Jeff spring before he was the pro tour director um, we worked together a little bit at the first time I, we went to Green Mountain Championship in 2017. So over the over time, you know, we've both kind of developed our roles in our respective companies. And so it made sense for us to just continue to work together. Um, they do an amazing job. They, I mean, they do all the legwork when it comes to actually putting on the events, you know. So that's like, that's why we would have, we end up having to pay for, you know, those, those because like, we're, we don't have the expertise of the team to set these events up. And if they don't get to do their job, then we don't get to do ours. Yeah. So like, it's been awesome. I, I really do uh, have a lot of respect um, for the, for the disc golf pro tour team um, and everything they do. Because like I said, if it wasn't for them, then the players wouldn't have a place to play on the, on the top level and the purses wouldn't be what they are. And then we wouldn't have any, you know, media teams like us wouldn't have any thing to cover you know we could always do local stuff but the fact is people want to watch the, the top level events so without yeah. them you know we'd have nothing so i i love it i love working with them and and uh hopefully we just continue to to do each put our best foot forward and keep you know bringing taking disc golf to new heights yeah so what do you think obviously now we've kind of settled into this thing with disc golf coverage to where there's a kind of a there's a really good relationship between the post-produced networks and the live network. But what do you think the relationship of live and post-produced disc golf looks like in the future? Do you think it'll be similar to what we've established now, or is there still some changes you think in the future? Yeah. So I think it's just going to continue to keep changing. I mean, we've only been doing this for 10 years now and it's just insane how different it is. And that from the post-production side, from the live production side, from the player sponsorship side, from the disc manufacturer, everything, everything's different. And so I can't even imagine, but I honestly, like I said, I feel like as long as we um, all continue to put our best foot forward and and, and provide the value that we do to the sport, I I just don't see things going, you know, changing too drastically. But then again, I don't know. Like we, like I said before, you know, technology is going to keep changing. The players are just continuing to get it getting better. Not even that long ago, the disc golf pro tour wasn't even a thing. It was just the PGA yeah. national tour and, you know, and then it was both. And now it's only the, the DGPT and we don't know. You see in the golf world, this tour comes out of nowhere and just takes all the players. Oh, yeah. Like that's very likely to happen at least one more time in the next 10 years, you know, if not more, yeah. we don't know. People can come out of nowhere. The same can be said for us on the media side. People can come out of nowhere and come take our jobs, you know, or, or absorb us. And, and then we all work for the same, you know, you know, big media company. I have, I have no idea. Like it's, it's just like, as we're, I feel very fortunate to have even made it this far for someone that just showed up um, randomly and filmed disc golf, like as a hobby. And now to have, 
to have this company and we have almost 20 employees and we have like a lot of people working on this and I, I, I feel very fortunate to have gotten this far and you know one day maybe it'll we'll finally film our last round of disc golf or something but I you know I won't look back and, and say like oh man like I wish I you know had done things differently that's my goal is just to make sure that we're giving it everything we got while we're here and and hopefully we're here for for life or whatever you know but uh, you know just learning to not take it for granted and just like give it everything you got because things change so rapidly it's just insane so yeah i i couldn't tell you what it's going to be like but i do i do know that i i think we're in the the golden age of of disc golf and the media is at an all-time high and the players are playing it out of their minds and the purses are getting higher and so it's just been great to be here and i we want to continue as long as i, I feel like as long as we continue providing value to the sport you know, as a whole, then, then we'll have a place, uh, here in disc golf. Yeah. Well, it's certainly, I think you got a great perspective on that. And it is so true that it seems like the pro tour just because they've gotten so established that they've been around for so long, but it really hasn't been long at all. Um, and the sport is definitely changing and subject to more change. If golf could be changed with a new tour after hundreds of years, then disc golf can certainly be changed again. Um, just have one more question for you before I let you go. And it's just kind of a fun question, but I I was kind of curious, you've gotten the film at all these different courses now doing the tour everywhere. What has been your favorite venue that you've gotten the film at so far? Hmm. I would have to say it's been a long time ago. I think this was in 2017. Yeah, it was 2017 and UC Marissa invited us. You know, he had us on the Disc Golf World Tour that year. And um, yeah. we got to go to uh, Czech Republic and go film at the uh, Kona Piste Castle Park. That was like a disc golf park that was a temporary course. And that's where we had the Kona Piste open. And it was amazing. Like the, the, the country is amazing. The, the course has a massive castle on the property, um, that was like at one point owned by, or yeah, owned by like Franz Ferdinand. I mean, it's super old. Like there's, it's just so cool just to see all that. And then the course, it just feels like you're, I don't know. It feels like you're in like a, like a movie or like a fairy tale or something. You got the course and then the, the rolling green fairways and the massive trees and, and it was just so cool. I, I don't think I'll ever see another course like that. There's so many amazing courses that I've been to all over the, you know, thankfully all over the country and a few times internationally. But I would say just as far as a course that I would love to be able to like return to and hopefully they'll have that event again at some point. Like I would love to go back. It was it was awesome. It was just like it was it just felt like you're in, in another world like it didn't feel yeah. like you're just at another in another state or another course you know on the tour it just felt like completely different and uh, i would love to go back it was uh it was definitely one of the highlights of of you know my career so far yeah definitely i mean that's certainly yeah it's always been bucket list for me to go see some of those european courses i was just talking to avery jenkins last night and he mentioned that course is one of his all-time favorites and he's played a bunch uh so i definitely can understand the hype but um other than that jonathan it was great having you on and hearing from you you guys at joe mez are just really killing it you're doing a great thing for disc golf and we hope to see more in the future yeah i appreciate it and then definitely hats off to you guys too foundation you guys have you know, you've been growing really rapidly. It's pretty awesome to see how it started not even that long ago and just how you guys are just continuing, like I said before, just one of these media content creators that is just providing more more content for the disc golf fans to, to consume. And I, I love it. I love that we're all here together at the same time and just giving it our best. And the fans are, you know, they're, they're really seem to be enjoying it. So I can't wait to see what we all come up with. You know, it's yeah. only been a few years and imagine what it's five, 10 years from now, what it's going to look like. It's just, it's awesome. So I appreciate yeah. you having me and appreciate all you guys do as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And thanks once again to Jonathan for joining the show. It was really cool hearing about Jomez. They have such an awesome product and they've worked hard to develop it. Um, if somehow you haven't heard of Jomez Pro, I'm not sure if that's possible, but if you haven't, make sure to check them out on YouTube and make sure to be back here next Thursday for another great guest. We'll see you then.